Put the lights on this audience again. <laughs> They're all men of a very certain type, which we are as well, aren't we? We yeah, absolutely yeah. are. It's very, very nice of you to ask both of us. I sort of forced my brother on you. He is, <laughs> I should say, sounded wrong. Uh, I should say, say what? He's very, very excited. I, yes. I haven't seen my brother this excited since his bar mitzvah. Ah. <laughs> I was very excited then. No, I'm, 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 I love you, I love your music, I love the band. I couldn't be more excited. Well, it's... <laughs> and of course, I, I have been interviewed by you in the past. So. It's for the Jewish Chronicle. Yeah. I'm sure they've all read it. <laughs> so you've had a lot of people interview you, a lot of different people interview you. Yeah, I'm a talking machine right now. It's yeah, crazy. yeah. Who else has interviewed you? I mean, I mean, I shouldn't ask because I believe I will definitely disappoint the audience now. But tell me who else has interviewed you? Well, in Great Britain, uh, Nicky Wire did our first show. That's great. It was just fantastic. Yeah. And very funny, sneaky funny. Yeah. Uh, Melissa Oftemar flew over from the U.S. Yeah, wow. she was great. Uh, I had this other guy, this Serbian guy that I know. <laughs> <laughs> and he kind of muscled his way into the show last night. Okay. And, uh, can't remember his last name. But, uh, but also uh, Will Ferrell, is that right? No. Uh, oh, no. Okay. <laughs> no, but Done your research. Uh, it's Will Ferrell's doppelganger, Chad Smith from the Red Hot Chili Peppers. Uh -huh. <laughs> so this is the thing that happens with him. You know, everywhere he goes, they, they get confused. Okay. And so he just refers to Will as the actor. Right, I see. I see. No, okay. I'm not the actor. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so, I think men of our age, we should probably sit down now. We should sit down? Well, we are quite old. There's a sofa over there. Are you, are you Would you like to sit in my living room? I'd like to sit in my living room. Okay. Let's talk, let's talk about my effing life. Let's talk about that. <laughs> you have the rare distinction of being the first duo uh, on, in the living room. So yeah. That's, that's quite a... Yeah, we're on it. That's quite a Very trio. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Can you tell us apart? Uh, <laughs> a little. Okay. Yeah. So, Kenny, the one question I just wanted to ask straight away, which is, you've answered, I think, I've heard you talk about why you called it My Effing Life, and it's because your life is fairly extraordinary, but why not my fucking life, basically? <laughs> why, why would a rock that's star... That's occurred to me. Why would a rock star be polite? Well, I'm not very polite throughout the book. I use the word fucking quite a bit. Okay. Um, but uh, my co-writer, Daniel Richler, who uh, did a marvelous job, and he's here tonight, you can give him a minute. Uh, so I would write a chapter, and then I would send it to Daniel, and he would, you know, clean up the grammar a little bit and remove some of the swearing. And okay. So we would sometimes find a uh, a common ground between fucking and whatever other swear word, and the word effing seemed to be very pliable. Right. Because you get the point across that you know uh, overusing uh, the word fucking, which is very good for emphasis. Yeah. So we saved that word. We've overused it quite a lot already, which I quite <laughs> like. My brother has been tapping me. I don't know why. Well, very gently. I just wanted to say, you, you said to me when I spoke to you before that an original title was My Life in Comedy. Yes. Why, why did you consider that title? Well, I wanted to call it My Life in Comedy, but my publisher didn't get the joke. Really? <laughs> <laughs> That's unfortunate. Yes, it is. <laughs> um, so, when you write a memoir, because I'm, I'm actually writing one at the moment, and one of the problems is remembering stuff. Because there's a lot when you get to, I'm going to say our age, right? There's a lot to remember. Well, you're generous, but yes. And, and, you know, you, I'm just going to say it, have taken a lot of drugs in your time. <laughs> I mean, you're straightforward about that in yes. the book. You did in the old days. Yes. So when it came to remembering all this stuff, how did you do that? Did you have a diary or did you go and ask people or just dredge it out? How did you do it? Well, um... I do have a pretty good memory, and I, I credit my love of baseball and my love of statistics for sharpening my mind, but 
um, there were many things that just came to mind. And when I was struggling with a particular memory, I would look through my files, because I'm a bit of a hoarder, and I kept papers and photographs from the period. And sometimes I'd look at a period, and I'd go, oh, and the story would just come racing back to me. On rare occasion, I would call Alex and ask him if he remembers a particular you know, fact about a gig or something. But I came to realize that memory is an entirely subjective thing, you know? Uh, so we could be talking about the same show, and yet he would have a completely different memory of that show, which was quite interesting, but... Um, was there anything that, that was a, a, a real struggle to remember? Was there anything that you, when you thought about it, like your memory of it didn't, like you wrote it and then it didn't tally at all? With anyone else who'd been there, or...? Well, there's some of the earliest stories when I was a kid, of course, where yeah. you're, you're, you think you remember, but you don't know if you actually are remembering or you've heard someone tell that story, and you're, so you're, you're very uh, in, influenced, easily influenced by shared memories. So, uh, But for the most part, a lot of things came back, and... Uh, you know, when you're talking about the 70s or the late 60s and drugs notwithstanding, um, you remember them in a sort of through rose-colored glasses. You know, you, you tend to remember those days as much happier than they probably were. But So they're easy memories to recall and to write about. What I found more difficult was going through the last 10 to 20 years because you, you kind of recall too much. You have so much information at your fingertips. You know, every minute of our lives are now captured on photographs. You have, and trying to discern what's important vis-a-vis -vis what you thought was important on the day was much more difficult. So I found that it was a real challenge. One of the things about this book, I don't know how many of you here have read it, but you should. It's, a, it's really a brilliant book. Can I just say, Thank it's you. really a brilliantly written memoir. And one of the things that's brilliant about it is, you know, Geddy's a really big rock star, but the domestic stuff about your life and the stuff about your parents is really unusual in a book, I would say, by, by a rock star. It, it mixes this incredible stadium life with some really poignant and funny detail about what it's like to grow up Jewish in suburban Toronto yeah. in the 60s and 70s, right? And so, I, I, not knowing that much about you, was quite taken aback by just how Jewish your life was. So perhaps you could start with, some people will know this, and you've talked about it, what your real name is. Yes, well, uh, my birth name was Gershon Eliezer Weinrib. And, uh, of course, when my parents... You got a woo, I don't know if you heard that. <laughs> there, was a, there was a Jew in the audience. Uh, uh, I have to say, that was a very little woo. Yeah. Well, they were very, oppre they were very oppressed people. Um, Gershon Eliezer... No, Ele... Weinrib. Weinrib, yeah. right. What's the, the middle name is? Eliezer. It is Eliezer, right. Gershon Eliezer Gershon Weinrib. Weinrib. Yeah. And so, uh, you know, my parents when they first came over, and in their tradition, uh, you know, they, um, obviously in the old country they were given Yiddish names. Yeah. And because they lived in Poland, they were also given Polish names. And so they didn't have anglicized versions of their names until they arrived in Canada. And oftentimes they were assigned uh, uh, anglicized names by the immigration officials who would say, okay, your name is uh, Manya, okay, that's Mary. And they would write it down, and uh, that would become their, their Canadian names. And so when we were born, they still didn't speak English very really well. And so the result was they gave us all Yiddish names. And in my case, uh, I was named after my grandfather, who was murdered in the Holocaust. And that's also a Jewish tradition, is to name children. It's good, because I thought you meant getting murdered in the Holocaust. So did I. <laughs> Which I thought was no, that early, was... early for that dark yeah. joke, to be honest. It is a, it is a tradition. <laughs> yes, I know, about being named after your grandfather. Named after someone who's departed. So myself and my two cousins were both uh, given the name Gershon, first name. Right. And then they had to kind of approximate uh, an English version for school you know, school enrollment and things like that. But in my case, 
because of three, uh, the three Gershans, me and my cousins, were born fairly close to each other, my mother uh, misremembered which name I had, which English middle name I had been assigned. So when I went through school, my, they, my name was Gary, which was the anglicized version, Lorne Weinrib. So Eliezer became Lorne. 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 Yeah. Okay. Gershon became Gary, yeah. Eliezer became Lorne, and Weinrib remained the same. Yeah. Lorne is very un-Jewish. <laughs> it's, it's very Yorkisher, can I just say, for any Jews in the audience. But Lorne, so Gary Lorne. Lorne Weinrib, yeah. Okay. And then when I was 16, I wanted to join the Musicians' Union and get a driver's license, so I applied for a birth certificate, and my mother sent away for it, and it arrived in the mail, and I opened up uh, the letter, and there it said my name was Gary Lee Weinberg. Right. And I said, Mom, what the fuck? <laughs> <laughs> this doesn't say Lauren, it says Lee. And she went, Lee. <laughs> Take. You know, I, I, yeah, I think you were Lee. I forgot. <laughs> I said, Just what forgot. The fuck? You forgot. So I wasn't sure what freaked me out more my sudden loss of identity or the fact that she couldn't remember my effing <laughs> name. Yeah. Um, to be fair, it was the name that was imposed on her because she had called you Eliezer. Yeah. So. And they had made a decision because all three cousins were had the same name, so they kind of, right. you know, this one will be Lee, this one will be Lauren, and she forgot which one she named. Right. You know, Lee is part of Eliezer, but you think maybe that would have prompted her, but clearly not. Well, you know, they didn't speak English very well, and they just went with the initial, right? But they, so did they came up with a name. Was Yiddish their first language? Yes. Think it was. Yiddish and Polish were their first So would you language. say Yiddish is your first language at some point? But we understood Yiddish right. as kids. They spoke Yiddish in the household all the time. They wouldn't speak Polish because that was the language of the people that handed them over in yeah. their view. So they, they would only speak Polish when they were swearing uncontrollably yeah. or when they didn't <laughs> want us to understand what they were saying. Right. But we got it because we had a pretty good handle on Yiddish in the house. Because Yiddish is a good language for swearing. Particularly, I've always thought schmuck yeah. is the only, it's a word for a penis that sort of sounds like a penis. Yeah. You know, well, which is, and they have some great curses. Like, you do one? You some want of the great, yeah. Was all sein Eugen Ostkriechen von Dan Kopp. Which means, may your eyes crawl out of your head. Wow. <laughs> yeah. Not something you want to say to your children uh, if they misbehave, right? Yeah. Uh, Can you translate my effing life into Yiddish? Can I translate it? Yeah, what would the title be in Yiddish? Well, to my mother it would be Mana Fakakta Leib. I'd like to do the whole of 2112 in Yiddish. <laughs> <laughs> it's been a place <laughs> in the temples of Syrians. <laughs> I get loud. So one of the things about, about that, we're going to get on to some more complicated stuff, but there's a beautiful story in the book, which you know you have told before, but I loved it so much, about your bar mitzvah, which I think does show <laughs> what kind of mum, what kind of Jewish mum yeah. your mother was. So do you want to tell the story about your, okay. your bar mitzvah photo, is really the story. Yeah, because, okay, so my dad passed away when I was about 12, and um, through that year, I was, my duty as the oldest male was to go to synagogue in the morning, in the afternoon and evening, say prayers three times a day for 11 months in one day, which I did dutifully uh, uh, before school and after school. And so it was a pretty uh, odd year, devoid of much joy in the household. And um, also, I felt kind of left behind my peers, like all my friends were listening to music, we weren't allowed to listen to music, and everyone was growing their hair, so I started growing my hair. And by the time uh, my bar mitzvah rolled around, I had hair that dared to be over my ears, and long bangs, and my mother was constantly uh, upset about the length of my hair. And so, she was so upset, like, typically in a Jewish home, when the child has a bar mitzvah, 
they do this magnificent photograph, you know, with all their prayer shawl on and the prayer book, and it sits on the mantelpiece in a proud place. Yeah, and it's embarrassing for a long time. Yeah, yeah, yeah embarrassing for a long time. So, but, but my mother refused to allow a photographer to photograph me with long hair. So she hired an artist, and she took a picture of me from a year earlier, and she got this artist to do a painting of me with shorter hair. And that's what hung on the mantelpiece for 60 odd years. It's amazing. It's like, your Jewish mother, she predicted Photoshop, but in a very weird way. When you finally did cut your hair for Grace under pressure, was she overjoyed, your mother? No, by that time she was disappointed because she had the son who was a rock star. Why do you bother to cut your hair now? It's going to hurt your image. Did my you... mother turned from being very against uh, my uh, love of music and not wanting me to quit school. The minute she saw me on television, everything changed. Oh, really? oh look. He's an entertainer. <laughs> I can tell my friends now. What am I going to tell them? He's on TV. What does your son do, Mrs. Weiner? He's on TV. What, what were you actually on? Like Canadian? Yeah, we were on a, a, a local, you know, kind of rock pop show. Right. And she saw us and it just changed everything. That was it. And then that was it. She became our biggest supporter. <laughs> because I, I was wondering in that chapter, the whole chapter where your dad dies is also very extraordinary. Um, and he died, you know, when you were 12 and how old was he? He was young. He was 45. Yeah, so he's 45 and you say something very poignant, which is that you think that his heart and his body gave out because of what he'd suffered in a concentration camp during the Holocaust, yeah. and that even though he, he was now in peacetime, that the after effects had their terrible effect. Yeah. And that, that the shiver in the morning, which so we come from a kind of weird house. It's a bit like yours, actually, because we went to a very orthodox Jewish primary school, but our dad was a total atheist and used to make us bacon and eggs for breakfast, right? Really? Yeah, so... That's true. That's Shocking, true. I calls it. But you spotted your dad, didn't you, once, eating yes. bacon, like surreptitiously, in a yeah. diner or somewhere. We were, <laughs> we were, we were in a, a department store, and my mother was buying something, and my father said, you know, I'm going to go have a coffee. And he went down and left, and I slipped away from my mom, and I followed him. Uh, not because I was spying on him, but I would rather have been with him than her shopping. Uh, but when I got to the cafeteria, he was sitting there at a table with an order of bacon and eggs. And I was shocked. I was like, holy fuck. It's okay to eat it. bacon and eggs. <laughs> didn't know that, so that was a secret. I never even told my mum that. Either. Really? Yeah, I busted them, but I kept it to myself. Until the book? Yeah. Wow. They're all gone. Yeah. But you also found out your father had some sort of musical heritage, didn't you? I did, and that was strange because I was already sort of on the road to success by that time. I was touring America, and I had stopped in Detroit, and I have some cousins there. And um, I had this lovely aunt in you know, I visited her and she started telling me stories about, you know, she said, well, you know, I'm not surprised that you have become a musician because your, your father, he was, he was a musician in the old country. And I, you could have knocked me over with a feather. It's like, what? I had no idea. Uh, apparently he played the balalaika at weddings and stuff, and made some money. This is just after the war when they were living in the displaced persons camp. And, and when they had moved to a small apartment, he was he was picking up extra cash by playing music. I had no idea. My mother had never talked to me about it. My dad had never, ever shown an interest in music. So I, at the end of that tour, I went home and confronted my mom. I said, why didn't you tell me? And she, you know, she looked sheepish. And I think she was embarrassed because she wouldn't let him schlep that fiddle, she held it a fiddle. She wouldn't let him take it across the ocean when they uh, immigrated. And is that right? Yeah. It was, she, for her, it was excess baggage. Right. And so maybe now she felt kind of guilty about it. But Okay. Yeah. It's not the guy in Fiddler on the Roof who's dancing behind Topol. He's not here. That's not him. No. Okay. So let's just talk about, it's chapter four, isn't it, that really tells... Chapter the, three, yeah. Three, okay. Jews don't count. 
so, those kids that can't count, uh, that tells their story. And I have to tell you, actually, I was, I, I was reading it. I wasn't on the toilet, I was in the toilet. Right? I was in the toilet because I was in this club and I knew I had this gig and I'm on the phone thinking I've got to read Getty's book and, uh, and I'm reading it and I just thought, like there's nowhere else to sit in this club that's quiet that I could read. So I just locked the door and sit in this toilet, Soho House in London, and I read this and I was just crying and crying and crying because it's so moving. I mean, it's weird that I told you that I was on the toilet, but hey. Uh, so one of the things that's extraordinary about Getty's parents is that they are survivors of Auschwitz and Dachau and Belsen, the worst places in the world. And they're not just survivors, they are romantic survivors. Their love survived. They fell in love from a distance in, I mean, I'm gonna let you tell the story, but I'm just gonna tell you what moved me, is that, that they're in essentially a ghetto, a work camp, then they're taken to places of death, and your father is so in love with your mother, he holds the love, mm -hmm. and then walks to Belson, and they, their love is it's there. So let, let me stop talking, and, and you, <laughs> take, you take it up. Well, okay, so um, it's rather complicated, but I'll try to be as, as succinct as I can be. But um, when the Germans marched into Poland, uh, my mother's town, Starkowice, uh, was a very important town to the German war machine because they had a munitions factory there. So uh, the typical thing they did um, when they marched into a town was they would ghettoize the Jews. They would put them in a separate location and they would start building um, work camps uh, and they would use the Jews as slave laborers. So while they were building these work camps, they had imported 100 young men in from another town that's about 60 miles away, which is my dad's town. And so during the, the beginning of that war in the work camps, uh, my dad was operating a crane, uh, you know, moving hot metal, and my mother was working on some sort of uh, oven where they baked the metal or they melted down the metal. And my dad just had an eye for her. He was about five years older than my mom. The teenagers though, right? Yeah, yeah. My mom was about 14 and my dad was about 19. And so he arranged for a piece of bread to be sent to my mom. Right. And he used this young man to, to deliver it. And my mother was mistrustful of it and she didn't know where it was coming from and eventually uh, he revealed himself to her as someone that had known about her through her brother. And she, she, he was paying attention. And my mother was ignoring him because he's so strong. She used to say, he was so strong and handsome, he couldn't have been Jewish. <laughs> so, so she bit self-loathing, but never let it pass. <laughs> yeah, so she, she stayed away from him for a while, but their flirtation persisted. And then when they were shipped to Auschwitz in 44. So the ghetto, the labor camp in Poland. Yeah, yeah. so they eventually liquidated. Yeah, they the liquidated lot. the ghetto. And those that remained, that were able-bodied, were allowed to continue living uh, and work in the new camps. In they Auschwitz. had built three camps just yeah. outside of Starkowitz. Yeah. And my dad and my mother both lived and worked in that camp. And then in 44, they were shipped to Auschwitz. Now in Auschwitz, they were separated into a men's camp and a woman's camp. And one day out of the blue, my mother gets a single shoe from a guard. And she says it's from, you know, Moynihan. And my mother couldn't believe it, A, that he was still alive, but B, a shoe. And so as my dad told it, um, he couldn't convince the guard to, to smuggle in two shoes, it was too dangerous. So they did it one shoe at a time. But to my mother, it was just an incredibly beautiful gesture. Oh know. God, that's so <laughs> beautiful. So people should understand, well, maybe you do, but if you read Primo Levis, If This Is A Man, which is the first ever record of Auschwitz, shoes were unbelievably important yeah. in Auschwitz. If you couldn't get a shoe, if you had the wrong sort of shoe, 
you would get festering sores on your feet and then they would get infected and you would be killed yeah. immediately. So that is, an, it's an unbelievably beautiful and also a life-saving gesture. Yeah. But that was the last, last contact they really had. And eventually my mother, when, when uh, the Russians were bearing down on Auschwitz, uh, as many people know who studied that time of the war, uh, there was panic in the Third Reich. And they started shipping uh, uh, as many uh, inmates of these camps into Germany. So my mother got shipped into um, Bel Bergen-Belsen, where she stayed for the rest of the war, and thankfully survived, of course. My dad uh, made his way, in the end, I found a, 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 a note from my mother that lines out that he was in seven different camps yeah. before he was left. That's in the book, the note is in the book. Yeah, yeah. I found that, that piece of paper. And uh, finally he was on one of those death marches. And 600 survived. kilometers or yeah. something. Yeah. Yeah. And he survived the death march. Uh, and after the war, he was in a displaced persons camp near Munich called Feldafin. And he bumps into my uncle my mom's brother. And every day they're looking on the board to see who had survived and who hasn't, and they see my mother's name. And so my uncle says to him, well, I'm just gonna go back to Munich where I have a little apartment that I can stash some stuff, I'll get my stuff, and then I'll come back and we'll go to Bergen-Belsen where they live. But my dad was too impatient and he left. And he hitchhiked and walked. Uh, it was about, I don't know, 350 kilometers, something like that. And he comes walking into Bernie Belson one day, and my mother uh, 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 almost faints. And I just could not believe that he was standing there. Even Spielberg, where the fuck are you? In the book, you talk about how your mother recounted that story to you a lot when you were younger and you had nightmares, but just hearing you talk about it now, I know you knew the story, but what was it like for you investigating it in the detail you did? How did you feel? Uh, well, I kind of put myself in the mind as a historian, but, you know, I needed to f make all the pieces fit, because my mother had shared so many stories with me uh, of my life of her life. Uh, some of them were just awful, as you alluded to, and some of them were, you know, quite empathetic. Uh, but as she got older, you know, my mother, you know, never met a story that didn't bear some improvement, you know, so uh, she would enhance the truth, just like if you asked her a question about how I first played the piano. She tells a story about when my sister had piano lessons, and I would be hiding under the, the table while my sister got these piano lessons, and then my sister would leave, and of course I would hop up on the bench and play like Glenn Gould, like a magnificent piece, which of course that's not possible, but it was not that guy. But anyway, so there I was, it was during the pandemic, I was locked down, I was dealing with a lot of uh, grief work anyway, because my bandmate, and good friend Neil Peart had passed away just a couple of months earlier. And so I just felt that like uh, this was a duty that I had to take on, and I started doing research. And I went to the Shoah Foundation and found interviews, not only with people from my mother's town, but my own family members, you know, cousins that lived, you know, in, in other cities that I had had regular connection with. And my, my uncle and my aunt, who, who both survived with my mom. Um, and then I found this remarkable book called Remembering Survival by this Professor Browning, who had done a study about that very town that my mother came from, just a remarkable coincidence. And he had studied, like, without getting too into the weeds here, so there was an awful police officer uh, that had brandished a gun the night of that um, liquidation that we referred to earlier, and he'd killed so many people. And he had eventually run off and was living in Germany, and he was put on trial. 
and they were flying in these very elderly uh, survivors of the Holocaust to testify against him. But it had been so many years that their memories were fallible. And the, the prosecution poked holes in their testimony, and the guy was found not guilty. Right. And this motivated this writer to tell the story. And he went back and he interviewed, you know, so many survivors and their family members, and put this incredible database together. And so my own family are mentioned are, and are quoted in, in that book. So I had all these amazing resources, and I just kind of put my head down and decided to go through it and cross-reference until I had this, what I feel is a very close approximation to what they lived through based on her testimony and all these other people. So, I, I, I mean, I really love talking more about this, but I have a sense there are some people in the audience who are thinking, when the fuck are they gonna start talking about Rush? <laughs> <laughs> but I'm gonna bridge that, because I wanna, I wondered if this background, this intergenerational trauma, this, realization of where, where you come from and the very, very complicated background you've had, how that plays in to you becoming a musician, becoming the musician that you are, in fact, you know, because I don't mean, I know that Rush have done a couple of songs directly about the Holocaust, but I mean in more general, how do you think you as an artist relate to this background? Well, I think my love of music came as a result of the year that I talked about earlier when after my dad passed away and I was not allowed to experience what all my my peers were experiencing. I mean, it was the mid-60s. The music of the mid-60s was vital and celebratory and, and, you know, and I couldn't take part in it. So when, when my duties were finished uh, as a good Jewish son, you know, grieving for his dad, I broke out and I needed to listen to all the music I could listen to, and you couldn't stop me. And I would scrape together whatever pennies I had, and I would buy singles, and I would listen to them, and then there was a chap who lived next door to me who was selling a guitar. And now, I don't know where I got the idea that I could play guitar, but I begged my mother to give me $10 so that I could buy this guitar, and I did, and she did, thankfully. And I sat in my room, and I just started playing everything I heard, and I kind of learned that if I heard a piece of music, I could figure it out. So it made me feel great after all the stories of my childhood and all this, and my house was not a happy place. Yeah. It was an overwhelmingly sad home, but in my room, music was alive and it was saving me. And so I never looked back from that moment. I never looked back. And you became a bass player by chance, really. Well, no one chooses to be a bass player. 